everyone. It certainly is exciting to be here tonight and to share with you the subject of Russia and its march on the Middle East that has been prophesied in, uh, in the Bible. The events going on in the world around us are certainly causing a lot of alarm all over the place. And uh, among Bible students, though, they are a cause of great excitement because they announce to us the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. We read in the book of Revelation in chapter 16 in the 15th verse, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And then he goes on to say he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So what excites us about what we're seeing going on in the Middle East is that we know that before Armageddon takes place, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth. That's the sequence of events that are given to us in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 15 and 16. The book of Revelation is called the Apocalypse. That's the original use of the word. It means to reveal or to show forward something. And at the beginning of the book in chapter 1, in verse 1, we read that it's the revelation or the apocalypse of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he tells us that the time is at hand. So it encourages us to pay attention because in no age that anybody has really lived is this expression being more relevant than today. We live on the very eve of the momentous events that are going to change the world forever. And we intend to spend the next hour or so looking at some of those prophecies that are given to us in the Bible. The Bible contains a lot of information about the future. And it's very helpful to us to, to be able to see this and to recognize that God tells us the events from the past. And in Daniel chapter 2, when Daniel meets the king Nebuchadnezzar, he tells the king that there's a God in heaven, verse 28, that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So that's the subject of much of Bible prophecy, what's going to take place in the latter days. And in fact, the prophet Amos tells us that surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets, in Amos chapter 3 and at verse 6. And so that's what he does. He tells us ahead of time what he's going to do, and he does it for a good reason. It's Isaiah 46 and verse 9. He says, I am God, there is none else. There is none like me. Why? Well, because he says, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. So that's what our God does. He tells us what's happened way in the past, uh, or what's going to happen in the future, way, into, uh, way in the past. So his counsel, he says, is going to stand, and he's going to do all of his pleasure. So those are just a couple of passages for us to think about when we're looking at our subject tonight, is that God has told the end from the beginning, and that's the purpose of Bible prophecy, to keep us excited about what's going on and to recognize the time in, in which we live. Well, we'd like to focus our, our session tonight on looking at the Middle East and the events that are going on there and what is going to lead up to the Battle of Armageddon that is described for us in the Bible. So it's really this invasion that's given to us in Ezekiel chapter 38. So Revelation chapter 16, the passage we looked at, verse 16, is that Battle of Armageddon. The detail of it is given in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. So if you've got a Bible open, turn to Ezekiel chapter 38, and you might want to just keep this open in front of you because this is where we're going to spend some of our time looking at who this, this great host is that's going to be involved in this conflagration. Now the interesting thing is Ezekiel chapter 38 has parallels. There's parallels in Joel, Zechariah, Daniel, all these different prophecies talk about an invasion in the time of the end. Well chapter 38 tells us of the, the hostile nations. We read in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, as the RSV and ESV puts it, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And he goes on to talk about in verse 5, nations of Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmer, helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarmer, the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Now it's really an entirely different subject to go through and identify who all these nations are. I'm just going to sort of explain them to you. Um, there's many historians that give us information on this, but Gog is the leader of confederacy, 
of which he says comes from the land of Magog. Now those of us who are a little bit older remember what was called the Cold War, and Eastern Europe, or the Warsaw Pact, which is between the River Don and the River Danube, is that area of Scythia, or Magog. Rosh corresponds with Russia in the north, Meshach to the area around Moscow, or the Muscovites, Tobolsk is Tubal, Persia, we knew it as Persia just a few years back, there was the Shah of Persia, or the Shah of Iran, as it is called today. Uh, Ethiopia and Libya have maintained their names, although they were a bigger geographical area. Gomer would correspond to the area of Turkey, originally Galatia, but then we have the Gomeric tribes, which migrated across, across Europe and ended up settling in Gaul, which of course, Galatia, Gaulatia, that's the same sort of idea. So you have the Gauls, who would be from the area of Gomer, so it's Western Europe, including much of uh, Germany as well, and Tagarma, which is the area up to the north of Turkey, um, Azerbaijan, Georgia, the uh, Caucasus areas. So those are the, the nations, and again, like I say, it would be a whole other class if we were to go through them. But in general terms, if you look at Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 15, he says that this host is going to come out of the north parts. And he's going to come with a great military host, riding horses, a great company, and a mighty army. And that north parts is rendered in the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, and in the Hebrew, as the uttermost parts of the north. And when we, we take all that information and we put it on a map, it might be a little hard to read from where you are, but those, there's the Mediterranean Sea and the, the current nations. But if we were to superimpose over that, the nations talked about in Ezekiel chapter 38, there is the geographical regions that we have with their ancient names. Russia in the north with Moscow above it, the uh, land of Magog, Gomer, Javan comes up elsewhere, which is Greece. Um, and then you have Assyria, Media, Persia, Babylon, which would be Iraq, uh, Libya, or Foot, as it's sometimes called in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, and Cush, or Ethiopia. So that kind of gives you the idea. So those are the nations that are involved as the aggressors in Ezekiel chapter 38, who make up part of the situation that we read about, part of Daniel as well, Daniel chapter 11. But we're also given the timing for when this is going to take place. And we say, okay, well, what exactly is that timing and Ezekiel 38, if you've got it open in front of you, come over to verse 8, because we read there, it's after many days you're going to be visited. In the latter years, well, you shall come into the land that's brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people and against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but they're brought forward to the nations and they're going to dwell safely, all of them. So that kind of gives you the time frame. It's when the Jews are back in the land, in the latter years, when the people who were once scattered are now gathered together and they're living in that land. Well, that took place over the period of the 19, or 18, late 1800s through the 1940s when there was a, a great returning of the Jews from the land in great numbers um, back into the land of Palestine, as it was called at the time. This is the Haganah ship Exodus, 1942. And they would congregate there over a period of time until eventually, on May the 14th, 1948, the state of Israel would be proclaimed by David Ben-Gurion in Tel Aviv. So that's the Jews back in the land. So we know that we're living in the latter days because Ezekiel says that the latter days equate with the time when the land is gathered out of many people and they're going to dwell again. But he also says, on the mountains of Israel. And the prophet Joel, in chapter 3, kind of flushes out what that means to us. Joel chapter 3, verse 1. Behold in those days, and in that time, what time? When I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. That's the time, he says, I'm going to gather all the nations. Remember Revelation 16? He gathered them to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So the gathering of nations takes place in the context of the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. We say to yourself, what was Judah and Jerusalem? Well, the ancient city of Judah, or uh, uh, area of Judah, is what we call today, uh, or Judea as it was, was be the West Bank, um, as it's called in the, in the media. And Samaria to the north, right? So Jude, Judea and Samaria is what we call West Bank, and of course the city of Jerusalem itself is right on the, the edge of that area. Well, it wasn't until 1967 when the captivity of Jerusalem was brought back because the Six Days War took place almost 50 years ago. They fought for six days, 
And on the seventh day, they rested. And they had brought back again uh, Jerusalem from the hands of the Gentiles, finishing what the Lord Jesus Christ refers to as the times of the Gentiles. That's referred to from Daniel chapter 8 and uh, picked up in the Olivet Prophecies. So that's the time period. And we could talk a lot more on that, but it kind of gives you the basic idea that we're in that time period. 1967 would have been the captivity of Jerusalem restored. The people are back in the land. So this equates with us the latter days. And it's at some time in those latter days that God is going to bring all these nations down into Jerusalem uh, and into Israel to battle. Well, what about the main nation that is involved in this group? And that is the nation of Russia. It's the Rosh of uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 and the king of the north that is described to us in Daniel chapter 11. So what about Russia? Because when you look at Russia's sort of resume over the last little while, it's not exactly the most stellar that you would think of somebody that could sort of, you know, pull something like this off. In fact, if you go back in the time uh, in history to the time of the Tsars, the last of the Tsars is Nicholas II here. And Russia was ruled by Tsars for about a period of 600 years since Ivan IV, who was the first Tsar, right the way through to this, this guy here. And um, it was an empire. He was an autocrat. He was the supreme ruler. But that empire would come crumbling down in and around the year 1917, when these two Charlies showed up and overthrew the whole thing with some other friends that helped them out. Uh, Lenin, of course, and Stalin. Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the uprising, the popular uprising, uh, the communists, and Joseph Stalin, who would succeed him, the brutal dictator who ruled Russia for 30 years, right the way through the period of the, the uh, Second World War, these were the two leaders that would become the first leaders of the USSR. And for many years, the Western world lived under fear of this whole group of people and their cronies. And uh, the ones that, like Khrushchev, he was the one who, during the Cold War, the nuclear missile program, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you were around then with Kennedy, you'll remember that, Brezhnev, the best set of eyebrows I've ever seen in my life, right? Here's the guy that would be the one who would send troops into Czechoslovakia and begin the invasion of Afghanistan. Andropov would follow him. He only lasted for about 15 months, um, but he was head of the KGB formerly and was again involved in this occupation of Afghanistan. Chemenko, only about 13 months as well. He didn't last very long either. And then, of course, Secretary Chairman Gorbachev and under him everything changed and in fact giving talks on Bible prophecy back in this point in time some people would say well should we talk about Russia anymore I mean like it's kind of like you know there's not a whole lot there that you really want to I'd say listen the Bible says it's going to be Russia that's going to do this but notice what it also says there's this little phrase that shows up in Ezekiel chapter 38 and it's at verse 4 and that tells you that although Russia is going to come forth, before that, there's going to be a temporary arrest of their progress. Ezekiel 38 verse 4 says, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. And then he's going to bring him forth with all his army and horses and horsemen, uh, all of them clothed all sorts of armor and so on and so forth. So for the years leading up to um, the fall of the Soviet Union, what we saw was a collapse under uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. In 1986, we had Gorbachev meeting with President Reagan and the nuclear arms treaty that was signed. In 1987 and 1988, he met with uh, the, pre the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. And in 1988, they withdrew from Afghanistan after these meetings. Uh, in 1989, they met with the Pope. And during this period of time, of course, there was great turmoil in Europe, beginning really around 1981, but really culminating in 1989, because you had that great solidarity movement, La Cloenza, and um, the whole sort of freedom that was wanted in Europe, that of course would come in 1989, when you would see the, uh, the Berlin Wall come crashing down, and followed up in 1991, where the USSR would pass into history after Gorbachev would resign. So that's kind of like, you know, what happened to this, this whole empire was it just seemed to become nothing. 
And in fact, as Gorbachev sort of passed off the scene, once he was gone, then you would have a long coming um, Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin, 1991 through 1999, so the dark years of the Russian uh, Federation as it was, very turbulent years, years of economic collapse. Russia was written off by most people as irrelevant, a thing of the past, and uh, you know, all kinds of problems. But of course, Yeltsin, he had his decade, so to speak. And by the end of it, 1999, he was replaced by an unknown guy, somebody who just came out of the blue, former KGB uh, FSB agent and chief, Vladimir Putin. And um, he just sort of appeared on the scene. And people were like, well, who is this guy? He doesn't even belong to a party. So they made a party up, and he joined it, and ran for president, and somehow miraculously made it in. And so... Um, under him, we heard about things like, you know, and people would say, well, Russia's still, you know, done because there was that whole Baltic Sea issue, the Bering Sea, I think it was, where they had the Kursk, the, uh, the nuclear sub that, you know, burst into flames and, and uh, everybody said, well, see, that's an, ex an example of Russia. I said, well, wait a minute. What it's an example of is they're bringing the subs out again. Like they've been sitting, rotting for a decade, but all of a sudden we got subs running around in the ocean again. What are they doing? And it was under Putin that they began to restore the, the Navy. And so his first step was really to restore the economy. So there was lots of military or economic reforms, and the oil and the gas began to really, really flow, and they started making a lot of money on it. And he turned Russia into an economic superpower. And he used the money from that to fund the military. And it was during his first go-around that Putin basically uh, brought about the Chechen War. He ran for two terms as president, and, and of course, both of those were quite successful. But by 2008, legally, he couldn't run anymore because they had that rule that like America has as well. You can run two uh, terms as president, and after that, you have to step down. Not like Canada where you have the same guy over and over again, you know. But so, so he figured, well, you know, what are we going to do here? So he got his crony, uh, Medvedev who came along in 2008, he became prime minister or uh, president and Russia, uh, Russia's Putin swapped jobs with him and he became prime minister and just kind of like moved back while Medvedev turned around and changed the constitution and said that he could run again and um, that's exactly what he did. So he returned to power in 2011 but during the time of Medvedev's rule the uh, Ossetia war went on in Georgia, a big fight over oil and gas lines going through that area and um, Putin comes back in 2011, and of course the military buildup has continued. And one of the big things that we saw under his last or his last reign really has been the uh, the Ukrainian war and the annexing of the Crimea. What's interesting though is that yes, there would be a temporary reversal of power, but then God says, "I will bring thee forth," and the scriptures tell us where Russia is going to go next. It tells us what it's going to set its sights on. So come back to Ezekiel chapter 38, looking at verse 4, he says, I will turn thee back. So we've looked, looked at that, how there was a temporary arrest of their progress. And then he says, I'm going to put hooks in your jaws and I'm going to bring you forth. And he says, it's all thine army, horses, horsemen, clothed with all sorts of armor, great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And they're going to come down into the Middle East. But notice that they are a heavily militarized group. So they don't just come back from obscurity as an economic superpower. They come back as a very militarized power and an aggressor that's going to be back on the scene. Well, in watching the news of the last little while, and you, know, you, you look stuff up and you read it and look at it on the internet or whatever you do, get your newspaper. Some people still buy newspapers. It's a good thing because I work for a company that prints them, but it's getting less and less. Um, but when you, when you look at the news and um, you see what's going on, what you're realizing is that that whole jaunt into the Crimea, you listen to what world leaders have to say. Now, this guy doesn't look very old, and he probably isn't, um, but he's the Estonian Prime Minister who on February 13th of this year said, Russia's aggression in Ukraine has fundamentally changed the situation, the security situation, in the whole of Europe. And NATO has responded with a higher readiness. So this is a Prime Minister saying that the game has changed. 
It's changed a lot. In fact, another guy, a guy named Anders um, Ramusen, he is the former Secretary General of NATO, on February the 5th, turned around and says, look, this whole thing in Ukraine, it's not about Ukraine. Putin wants to restore Russia to its former position as a great power. There is a high probability that he will intervene in the Baltics to test NATO's Article 5. Right? So this has been going on in Ukraine, and these are not like nobody sort of Bible prophecy freak nuts, you know, that are saying, look what's going on. This is like world leaders saying, look what's going on. And so the head of NATO is sounding the alarm. But the scripture is very clear. This is a militarized host. A resurgent Russia is going to be militarized, and it's going to militarize its partners. Take a look at Ezekiel chapter 38. Pick up the language again, verse 4. Army, horses, horsemen, armor, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. The cross-reference, if you care to look at it, is Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. Here he talks in terms of two great hosts, a king of the north and a king of the south. And in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, he talks about a time of the end when the king of the south is going to push at him, which is actually Turkey, and then the king of the north is going to come against the same him, which is Turkey, like a whirlwind. And we'll look at that in just a moment, with chariots and horses, a horseman with many ships. And he's going to enter into the countries and pass over, and overflow and pass over. So you have chariots, which today we would call tanks, with the horsemen, and many ships. Well, today we have both ships of the sea and we also have airships in today's world. So, if that's what we read about is in the Bible, what does the news tell us about the resurgent Russia? Is it an, is it a, is it an economic power only, or what is taking place? Well, this is March the 11th, 2014. The Russian Navy is to receive 24 subs, 54 warships by 2020. So this is the head of the, the Russian military, Defense Minister Shogu. He says, as a result of the implementation of state rearmament program to 220, the Navy should receive eight nuclear-powered strategic submarines, uh, 16 multi-role submarines, and 54 warships of various classes. So if we think Russia is rotting away and finished, think again. This is what they're doing with their military. And that is from the Russian news out of Moscow. Well, Newsweek on March the 30th, 2015, tells us that they're not keeping those arms in Russia either. These are being moved, or some of them, into European arms depots. We read Vladimir Putin quietly has been arming another area inside Europe's borders. Kaliningrad, the Russian seaport city in the region sandwiched between Poland and Lithuania, a little piece of the empire they held on to, with convenient access to the Baltic Sea. Vessels from Russia's Baltic fleet have delivered fighter jets, missile launchers to the former German city, from where missiles could not just reach uh, Warsaw, um, but they could basically reach um, all kinds of other places, Germany as well. So they've been spending much time in preparing all of this. Now, this is a headline now from just last week. This is last Tuesday, September the 29th. The UK Express says the UK must prepare for war with Russia. The army calls for a fleet of battle tanks to take on Putin. And so that's the headline. Britain must invest in a fleet of main battle, or battle tanks to meet the increasing uh, threat of a ground war with Russia. What is this all about? Well, the prospect of a conventional ground war in Eastern Europe, he says, can no longer be ignored. So a ground war in Eastern Europe is the prospect that this leading commander is concerned about. And probably for good reason. Because when you look at what's been going on, this is March 27th of this year, the Russian Air Force and Navy are to receive 200 aircraft in 2015. That's more than most world air forces even have. So what they're getting in addition to what they've already got is what more than most air forces actually possess altogether. And so what are they doing with these planes? Well, the Russian heavy bombers flew more out-of-area patrols in 2014 than in any other year since the Cold War. 
This is just some nobody. Actually, it is somebody. It's Admiral William Gortney, the commander of the U.S. Northern Command. He's telling us that Russia has done more since 2014 than it did in any year since the Cold War began. So that whole area of, of events is basically picking up. What's also interesting is Ukraine. What was such the big deal about the Ukraine? Well, if you go back, and this has been proven in the news in the last little bit, but go back to March the 30th of this year, Russia says its Crimean military buildup has been completed. Uh, it intends to use its presence there to spearhead Russian interests in the Mediterranean Sea, extending Russia's presence in long-range sea zones. That's what Sevastopol was all about. So when they annexed the Crimea, it wasn't about the Crimea. Just like the one prime minister said, it's got nothing to do with Ukraine. What they're looking for is to restore themselves to power. And to do that, they need a jump-off spot. So the Crimea and Sevastopol is the jump-off spot. And they're going to use it to extend into the area of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, funny that, because that's exactly what they've been doing. But how concerned should we be? You know, is this just sort of Bible prophecy, you know, zealots getting a little excited about what's going on in the world? Well, let's listen to what the head U.S. military brass have to say about this. The outgoing U.S. Army Chief of Staff calling Russia the most dangerous threat to the United States today. More than ISIS, more than China. I'm concerned. They have shown uh, some significant capability in Ukraine to do operations that are fairly sophisticated. And so for me, I think we should pay a lot of uh, attention because a true deterrent is one where people are worried that if they do conduct operations, there will be some level of response. And I think we have to continue to improve what that level of response might look at so we can deter. Vladimir Putin's Russia behaves in many respects as in, in some respects, and in very important respects, as an antagonist. That is new. That is something, therefore, that we need to adjust to and counter. Russia poses uh, existential threat to the United States by virtue simply of the size of the nuclear arsenal that it's had. If you want to talk about a nation that, that could pose an existential threat to the United States, I'd have to point to Russia. And if you look at their behavior, it's nothing short of alarming. I would put Russia right now from a military perspective as the number one threat. The United States is concerned by reports uh, that Russia may have deployed uh, additional military personnel and aircraft uh, to Syria, uh, precisely because it's difficult to decipher uh, their intentions. These steps could lead to greater loss of life, they could increase refugee flows and risk confrontation uh, with the counter-ISIL coalition that's operating uh, inside of Syria.